disgrace in the familia. Life is now hell around the house. Papa either doesn't talk to me or he grunts when I go by. The relatives on Papa's side, every single one of them disown me. Little old ladies come up to me on the street. Eh, hey, Tommaso, don't you know you're killing your mama? The neighborhood kids start calling me names and threatening to beat me up every time I leave the house. Finally, Papa issues his ultimatum. You either cut the gay shit or you don't come home no more. <clears throat> don't wait up for me, Papa. Dancing, dancing, we're gonna meet that. What the fuck just happened? A moment ago, the music was blaring at ear-shattering levels. The dance floor was mobbed. I was checking out that cute guy over there. All of a sudden, the music died. The lights are flashing. I know it's not closing time. Guys are dashing back and forth as if they're trying to go somewhere. I don't know where. Someone says, it's a raid. Someone else says, the cops are here. Huh? Oh shit. There they are. At the front door. Two of them. There's no way out of here. I'm only 19. Drinking age is 21. I've got my brother's expired driver's license. Him and I look a lot alike. People always think we're twins. He knows I use it to get into bars, but not gay bars. I gotta get out of here. I see a door. It opens to a kitchen. There's an old guy washing glasses at the sink. I explain to him that I'm just a minor. He points to another door. It opens to a yard and then an alley. Next thing I know, I'm standing in front of the bar. There's a paddy wagon parked out front. I walk across the street. And I wait. A few moments later, the cops are leading a group of guys into the paddy wagon. They slam the, they slam the paddy wagon shut and drive off. The next morning, there's an article in the newspaper about the raid, including the names and addresses of all the guys arrested. I'm not surprised. I'm just a faggot. My life doesn't matter to them. Just like the lives of all those guys who are going to lose their apartments and their families and their jobs. They don't matter to them. The cops will get their payoffs. The politicians will be able to brag about cracking down on vice like they do every election. Cracking down on vice. That was the 1971 version of making America great again. It was South Philly's idea of a shopping mall. A big, old, worn out warehouse in a working class neighborhood that was subdivided into these little department stores. I worked in a record store that was managed by this guy who was born with a lit joint in his mouth. I kid you not. He used to call me Tommy Stardust because I came to work in various forms of drag. Um, actually, not the kind of drag you're thinking of, you know, um, with the pearls and the beehive hairdo. It was more like gender fuck. Think of a, 
a cross between John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe. That was me. I was exploring my gender identity. Ever since I was a kid, I wasn't sure if I was a boy or a girl. My manager thought I was trying to be the next David Bowie. <laughs> I kept trying to tell them I was simply trying to be fabulous. The mall was owned by a Mr. K who had an office in the back. Rumor had it, if you were ever called back to that office, you were never seen again. Mr. K hated our department. Well, we all had long, straggly hair. We wore beat up old clothes to work. And we played loud rock music all the time. Mr. K kept trying to impose a dress code. So one time he sent around this memo saying that we all had to wear shirts and ties to work. Ha! I showed up the next day in pink hip hugger jeans and my sister's blouse. The first time that Mr. K deemed to talk to me, he asked me if I was a boy or a girl. The next time, he called me a freak of nature. That was before my actor-singer boyfriend Arnold showed up on Valentine's Day to serenade me at the cash register, which was in the front of the store, where there was no wall and no door. So everyone throughout the whole mall, and probably for blocks around, could hear. Of course, it didn't hurt that he had a voice that Ethel Merman would have killed for. So they gathered, black women and Italian women, standing side by side as a very handsome black man serenaded a very exotic looking Italian queen. The bells are ringing for me and my guide. The birds are singing for me and my guide. Everybody's been knowing to a wedding they're going. And for weeks they've been sewing. Every Susie and Sal that congregated for me and my guide. No Parsons waiting. For me and my guy, and someday we're gonna build a little home for two, just two, no more, no more, in love line for me and my guy. The women broke into thunderous applause as Arnold reached over the counter and kissed me passionately on the lips. Suddenly, the wall of women was parted like the Red Sea, but instead of Moses, there appeared Mr. K. He was spitting fire, not water. What the hell's going on here? You, he said to Arnold, out of here. And you, he said to me, in my office, now! And just as suddenly as he had appeared, he disappeared. Oh, shit. <laughs> hey, that was really cool, dude, my manager said. But Mr. K wants to see me back in his office. Hey, chill out, dude. Chill out. Yeah, he was that out of there. When I got back to Mr. K's office, the union rep, Karen, was there. Mr. K read me the riot act and fired me. Karen said, well, wait a minute. Only the manager of his department can fire him. Mr. K said, oh, that idiot. And then he played what he thought was his ace. He's a pervert. He attracts other perverts. We got kids who come into this store. Families. I won't have this in my store. Karen warned him that he better not be trying to fire me for being gay. Mr. K said it was his store. He could do whatever he wanted with it. 
their eyes locked. Sweat beaded their foreheads. Their fists were clenched. Time stood still. Finally, Mr. K threw up his arm. Get the hell out of my office! The old tough white guy brought down by an even tougher black woman. As we were leaving the office, Karen said to me, you know, your friend there has got a really nice voice. Where did you meet him? She was a little too comfortable with the whole situation. I think she was a friend of Dorothy's, <laughs> a member of the family, if you get my drift. Her secret was safe with me. As for Mr. K, he never fucked with this freak of nature again. Mm -hmm. Oh shit. I'm not wearing any men's clothes. That's what I'm thinking as I stand on the edge of the New Jersey Turnpike. Hot summer night, 1973, as the state trooper who pulled us over suddenly turns his attention to me. After having frisked my three friends, the four of us driving up to New York to go to a gay dance in Sajid's old beat up car. I'm going to get arrested for female impersonation. Drag is against the law. I wonder what the penalty is in New Jersey. I wonder if I could plead temporary insanity, reefer madness, brought on by Sadge's killer weed. Oh God, I'm gonna have to call my papa to come and bail me out. Oh shit, if the cops don't kill me at the police station, my Italian papa will do the job for them. But you know, Sadge could always get his way out of any fix. He always had an ace up his sleeve. I did what he told me to do before we got out of the car. I remember his last words. Don't say nothing. No matter what happens, keep your big trap shut. The state troopers looking me over now. He's standing so close I can smell his sweat. Why doesn't he say something? He's already checked over the car, the glove compartment, the trunk, everywhere, looking for drugs. He knows we have drugs. He'd love to bust us. Oh wait, I think he's gonna say something. Is he reaching for his handcuffs? Um, Miss, you can get back in the car now. Whew. I'm driving back up to New York now. Wow, nobody says anything for the longest time. Finally, Arnold breaks out laughing. And then we're all laughing. <laughs> and then Arnold reaches over, unzips my pants and pulls the bag of breasts out of my underwear. <laughs> Sag was right. It was the one place the state trooper would never think to look. Mm -hmm. Uncle Carlo wants me dead. Uncle Carlo the good cop who beats his wife and brags about beating up drag queens in the gay area of town. Uncle Carlo, who called Papa the night I was on TV. Uncle Carlo, who's been trying to turn Papa against me all these years. Uncle Carlo told Mama and Papa 
and he wants to get a contract out of me. You know, like in The Godfather, fit me for cement high heels and a permanent residence at the bottom of the ocean with Charlie the Tuna? <laughs> Mama read him the riot act. She told him that if he touched one head, hair on my head, she would track him down and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> you better believe she'd do it. Papa just sat there. He didn't say nothing. Mama wants me to be careful. She told me to watch out for myself. What am I going to do? Be scared to walk down the street? No way. I may live to regret this, but I ain't gonna let Uncle Carla ruin my life. No fucking way. Bad cop, no donut. Wait a minute, after all these years, pa 
what got into him. The thing with Uncle Carlo and the contract? Really? Did he say that? I didn't think so. Well, I can't look a gift horse in the mouth, I guess. So, what color dress should I wear? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I'm joking. Okay, sure, I'll talk to you, bye. La 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 The paint by number last supper that I did as a kid is still hanging over the same dining room table. I can't remember the last supper we had as una familia around that turbulent table. The sound of so many voices all talking at once still echoes in my head. Upstairs in my old room, the bed is freshly made. The bureau and the desk where I wrote countless poems and songs are exactly where I left them as if they were expecting me to come back. The queer prodigal son, who's finally made his way back home. A truce having been declared between father and son, who haven't spoken for 15 years. A truce arranged by my oldest brother. As we're getting ready to leave, Papa says to me, it's cold out there. That jacket you're wearing, it ain't warm enough. He reached into the closet and pulled out an old brown jacket. He insisted I take it with me. It was his way of saying, welcome home, son, just two months before he died. <laughs>